Thank you all for joining us today from, for the View from the Administration Local Leaders Advancing Climate Resiliency Panel. Before we dive into our first panel, we have Mayor Weinroth from Palm Beach County to spotlight climate issues and resiliency actions in Palm Beach County. Enjoy. In South Florida, we know that we are affected by sea level rise. We know that we're affected by people who are on the roads every day commuting. And so to me, it is important that we are striving to control our environment, address the issue of the sea level rise as it's going to affect our infrastructure, encourage people to get out of their cars, walk more, have complete streets, and really put them closer to where they want to be. The county is proud to be a partner in the Coastal Resilience Partnership. I think that's an important step in working with our partners, the municipalities and our counties here in South Florida, to be able to attack this problem on a regional basis. It's not enough for us to just look at it from a city basis or from a county basis. It's really a regional problem. They are looking at us to be able to preserve what we have here, to improve what we have here, and not just to leave them with the, the problems that we've created. I think that we are, as a board, trying to make sure that we're building an infrastructure that's going to support them going forward. Again, complete streets. We want them to get out and walk and enjoy our infrastructure, our urban core. We want them to be able to get from place to place without relying upon the private passenger vehicle. And there's so much to enjoy here in South Florida, and we can do it and still have a, a wonderful paradise to live here. This is paradise, you know, going outside and enjoying this weather, enjoying the beaches that we have here, enjoying the miles of beaches, enjoying the parks. This is the place to live. And I certainly would never want to go back up to the Northeast. I, I love it down here. And I think that it's a great opportunity living here and enjoying what we have. To. Thank you, Mayor Weinroth. Counties in Southeast Florida are complex entities with a broad array of responsibilities. In this panel, we'll hear from top level members of county administrations about how they're dealing with climate change and how they're internally coordinating on these issues. This panel will be moderated by Monroe County Commissioner Holly Reshine. Commissioner Reshine is a former member of the Florida House of Representatives for a district that includes Monroe County and Southern Miami-Dade County. Recently, Governor DeSantis appointed Commissioner Rashine to the Monroe County Board of County Commissioners, seat District 5. Thank you so much for moderating today's panel, Commissioner. Thank you, Megan. And are we ready to get started? All right. Yesterday, we heard from elected officials from the four compact counties about how they're working to promote resilience and sustainability. Today, we'll hear from members of their administrations, the staff members charged with putting board direction into effect. I'm happy to introduce our four panelists. <clears throat> First, we have Virginia Baker, Palm Beach County Administrator. Next, Bertha Henry, County Administrator for Broward County. We also have Chief Operations Officer from Miami-Dade County, Jimmy Morales. And finally, and my favorite, County Administrator Roma Castezzi of Monroe County. Thank you all for joining me. Mr. Castezzi, let's start with you. Counties provide a large variety of services to their populations. 
How do you get your different departments with very different priorities and responsibilities to work together on climate resilience? Thank you for the question, Commissioner, and thank you for everybody putting this together. Uh, it's, it's always an honor to be part of this group. Uh, I've been part of this group since the beginning. This is year 12 or 13, I think it's 13. And we in the, in the county, in Monroe County, have been talking about it for 13 or more years. So if you live down there, like Mayor uh, Rice said yesterday, we're the canary in the coal mines. Uh, there's no upland to go to as the water starts rising. So everybody that lives in the Keys uh, knows that we need to deal with this. It deals with it, uh, especially during the king tides in the fall, uh, is aware of the situation. So when it comes to the department heads, they are aware of the situations too. They have to drive through the flooded roads to get to work and, and, and get around town. So they know what's going on. Uh, we also have something two or three times a month we call SMT, Senior Management Team Meetings, where we go around, it's called, we call it whoop around and each uh, director, 24, 25 directors, uh, explains what they're doing and what's going on in their departments. So that way we're all cross-trained. And obviously this conversation has been had for, you know, like I said, about 13 years now. We've also done a vulnerability analysis, a flood analysis of roads um, that we're finishing up now this, this year, or actually early next year. Uh, we spent over $2 million on it. And what looks like it's going to happen is that we're going to need about $1.8 billion to upgrade our infrastructure and our roads, elevate our roads. And, and elevating the roads is, is the inexpensive part. It's what you do with the water. This is the water management part of it, the stormwater management part. It's very expensive. And since we don't have big land masses, we have to pump it underground, which is very expensive to maintain the pumps and those kind of things. So uh, getting back to your question, it's, it's, it's our, in our DNA. We know we have to deal with it in the Keys. We are the canary in the coal mine, so everybody's aware of it. It's easy to get all the departments working in the same uh, direction. Thank you, and that's wonderful and incredibly expensive. Ms. Baker, perhaps you could tell us how Palm Beach County is getting all of your departments to work together on resilience. Thank you very much. Um, what we're doing here in Palm Beach County, approximately three years ago, uh, we underwent a de-siloing process. We set up a roughly about six cross-functional teams uh, to address specific priorities of our Board of County Commissioner, and, it's, and that is their strategic goals, such as housing and homelessness, uh, infrastructure, and economic issues in the county. These teams are comprised of our high level managers along with our mid-level managers, as well as our staff on the ground. Uh, this allows the departments across lines to discuss, meet regularly and cooperate with each other in coordinating things like grant applications, planning, uh, making sure that when we're going into for capital uh, projects, we work together. Our director of utilities as well as engineering are on these teams. And this allows us to avoid uh, duplicating efforts or going back once we build a road and then it's time to replace a pipe, we've got to dig up the pipe. So we're now working so that within a five-year capital plan, we know exactly when a pipe needs to re be replaced and when we're going to uh, resurface that particular road or widen that road. We cooperate, plan it together so we do it once. We inconvenience our residents once and we don't have to double count uh, those particular dollars. We have our Office of Resiliency also involved in these cross-functional teams to ensure that we're meeting the projected guidelines and our outstanding uh, Director of Resiliency, Megan Houston, is there at the table and our staff knows to definitely work with her and listen to her. We not only do that, we also also look at our natural areas to make sure that we're doing things that will extend the life of our particular investments in those particular areas. That's wonderful and Megan is fantastic. Thank you for that. Would anyone else on the panel like to add to Ms. Baker's comments? Commissioner uh, Jimmy Morales, and, and you know, in Dade County, the, uh, the role, Miami Dade County, the role of the Office of Resiliency has, in fact, helped uh, work across silos. Um, you know, we went through a resilient 305 process with the Rockefeller Foundation and two of our cities, Miami and Miami Beach. Uh, and, and, and by having that office focusing 
and working directly with all of the departments and getting them to work together, uh, it, it, it really does uh, reduce those silos and, and get people talking. Mayor Levine Kava came in and, and has continued that with uh, you know, weekly cabinet meetings of the chiefs who, to whom all these departments report. So we're coordinating uh, very regular uh, meetings with all the department directors. Uh, and and I, so I think um, in addition to just what necessity has mandated, uh, we really try to have an organizational structure where people are working across departments because these solutions are multi-department in nature. They sure are. Thank you for that. Ms. Henry, COVID has been an obvious priority for the last year and a half. How has your county's response to the pandemic informed your approach to longer term climate resilience? Well, first and foremost, it, it reemphasized the importance of planning and preparation. You cannot execute if you don't have good plans and you have not prepared and exercised those plans. So those, those um, it was a reaffirmation of how important that was. Um, when I think about um, other lessons learned on this issue, I'm going to start with collaboration. I have to tell you that I spent more time with Ms. Baker and Jimmy Morales's uh, predecessor um, during the, the height of the pandemic than I did through my entire career. Why? Because collaboration was key. It was really important that um, just as climate change, you can't limit it to a specific geography, that you, this, is a, uh, this is a planet issue. What we learned in South Florida, what was going on in um, the Keys soon made its way to Miami-Dade and, and further north. So it was really important that we that we talked to each other, that we collaborated, that we talked about the things that we were doing. Um, also for my, um, for my organization and the employees, um, it became abundantly clear that um, every county employee was essential. I don't know that a lot of people thought about that prior to the pandemic and prior to us as we're having this conversation about we're all in it together when the rubber hits the road and clearly during this pandemic it did um, the interdependency upon um, each other became very pronounced it was important that the community understood that you know think about it when all of a sudden people are um, concerned about getting to the grocery store or getting and who's going to service um, uh, take care of their kids and so forth and so on, um, it became clear we were all one. And, and, in, um, and when you think about resilience and climate resiliency in particular, this planet, we all share it. And, we, and um, it's important that we all under, understand that. I think the other thing that was um, helpful to not only my organization, but um, to the community at large, I had so many people say, particularly when we were all on lockdown, when they were able to you know, step out that door for a moment and feel how crisp the air felt, how fresh things seemed, the grass was greener, the skies were bluer. Um, you can't get much bluer here in South Florida, but I have to tell you, people just couldn't believe it. The animals were coming out and they were free to roam. It, it said, to all of us that when we, um, when we talk about the ravages of, of what we are doing to this planet and that it is correctable, that we can fix it, we had an opportunity to see it live and in action. So people that were skeptics in the past, we lost a lot of that skepticism because we were able to demonstrate that it can happen, it can make a difference and, and we're all the better for it. And that is so true, so true. I love how you encapsulated that. That's just the visual was amazing and absolutely collaboration is key in all of these things. Thank you for that. Does anyone else have anything to add? Okay, moving on. Mr. Morales, as I mentioned, counties provide a broad array of services and perform a lot of tasks. 
Where do you see your county's greatest vulnerabilities and which county functions do you think are most critical to addressing climate change? Don't forget to unmute. I know you're saying great things. I, sh I should have had this down by now, sorry. <laughs> Commissioner, you know, the biggest vulnerability we face is really with our water system. Uh, we've got the Everglades to the west, Biscayne Bay and the Atlantic Ocean to the east. And so we're dependent on that unique balance between land and water. Um, but, you know, one of the greatest challenges we have is the tens of thousands of homes and businesses that are on septic systems uh, in our community. Um, over 120,000 properties in Miami-Dade County are still on septic tanks. I myself live in a neighborhood where I have no ability to connect to a sanitary sewer system. And I live in an infill neighborhood in Coral Gables. So you can see the challenge we have. These systems are already failing because of rising groundwater, contributing to the decline of Biscayne Bay. They pose a public health threat during extreme rainfalls and rain bombs and during king tide season. Now, the good news is the county is, uh, particularly through the auspices of our water sewer department, put together a septic to sewer plan of action. But we cannot fully implement it without some help from the state and the federal government. The price tag is obviously very high because it's not just helping people connect to a sanitary system. In many areas, you've got to build out the sanitary system. The mayor and commission are working diligently to seek federal and state funding. Uh, and our water and sewer department has already initiated, where we do have funding, projects in some of our most vulnerable areas, like the Little River Basin. Also, I think like other compact counties, the people in our county are vulnerable. The pandemic has highlighted the vulnerability of our workforce that is dependent on tourism and how vulnerable people are to income disruption. Building climate resiliency, therefore, cannot be done in a silo where projects do not also advance social equity, lift people out of poverty. You know, the mayor recently released her, her Thrive 305 action plan, which is aimed at transforming the way the county does business to improve accountability and transparency, while also driving forward meaningful community engaged planning like that of our adaptation area action. So with respect to the county, uh, from our fire and police stations to our wastewater treatment plants, we have to be proactive in planning for climate resilient infrastructure that's able to withstand current and even more importantly, projected climate impacts. So whether it's elevating our critical facilities, adding solar power and battery backup, we're working across the government departments to integrate climate resilience. And we're using it as a lens through which we do business. Every department and every one of our 29,000 employees have a critical role to play in, in building a thriving, resilient Miami-Dade County. And so when you ask, you know, what are the functions? It's all across. If, if our police department isn't resilient, then we're not resilient. You know, if our water sewer system obviously isn't, where is it? And so we view it as something that every, every one of our departments, every one of our employees have to think about every day. Thank you so much for that. And you can learn some lessons from the keys when it comes to septic to sewer. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Yes. And again, thank you for that. Does anybody else have anything to add? I would also say the good news is that um, we're all sort of suffering from the same issues in the region. So you don't have to have um, a, a county centric response uh, to a lot of these issues. So when you when you look at this, and this is why we have this four county uh, compact. Uh, again, you're looking at it as a region. So the things that you may have missed uh, initially, when you find out what's going on in the keys, because I learned from from Roman and so forth and so on, that you need to make sure you start plugging those holes too, because eventually you'll you'll suffer with that. So you don't have to tackle um, these issues. Um, alone um, or on your own and eventually you're going to feel the impact or see the impact that your neighbor to the north or the south um, has seen so we're all suffering with some of the same issues and if we approach it from the perspective of we're learning from each other uh, maybe we can short circuit the learning curve i agree and with Mrs. Henry on and and uh, Jim and Morales on that particular issue, and I know Roman also agrees. It is our regional approach that has assisted us throughout this process, uh, even with 
you know, before the pandemic, we had our regional approach uh, with hurricanes, et cetera, other disasters impacting us and we're able to reach out. And I do believe the sewer to septic is a major issue for all of us, not just within our region, but to the region north of Palm Beach County uh, that we're gonna have to address it. Our board was very instrumental in approving us utilizing some of our cares as well as our ARPA dollars to do some sort of septics. And so on our schedule, we're moving a lot of our, the result of our, the remaining portions of our park off septic onto sewer because if county government doesn't do it, who else is going to do it? We've got to start the trend to ensure that we're protecting our waterways, uh, not for now and into the future. Uh, we're also, we've got resiliency tied into our capital plan to ensure that we're not missing anything. And as the actually county managers and administrators throughout the state, when we do our whip around at our FAC conference, then we also talk about the various issues impacting us. And we, we are able to make sure that we're covering those aspects that we personally have not thought about at home, but when others bring it up in those meetings, we then investigate and we're able to assist each other. So it is just not our region. We've taken this process. Thank you, Bertha, because you were the first from South Florida, uh, but we've taken it you know, statewide to make sure that we're communicating with each other and sharing our experiences. Uh, that way counties also know this could hit us and here's how it can be handled. And that's wonderful feedback. And that's exactly, you ladies hit the nail on the head. That's exactly why we have events like this is, is all that discussion, all that collaboration. And actually, Ms. Baker, you're up next. How does your jurisdiction work to ensure that climate equity is being addressed? That is making sure we are providing climate adaptation and mitigation solutions for those most in need. Well, again, we uh, make sure resiliency is involved. We've got our cross-functional teams. Uh, we have areas that we have focused on for many years. It's called our uh, commun countywide community revitalization areas. Those are our most vulnerable communities within the county, and we work uh, collaboratively with our municipalities on their areas. But we make sure that when we're going in, let's take, for example, rehabbing homes. We look at, and we've got a cap, and we look at how do we make this home a bit more resilient, whether it's replacing the roof or if we've got to replace windows, we throw in impact windows that not only helps us during the next disaster, but it also helps on the electric bill. It keeps the houses cooler. It keeps them uh, warm in the winter, which we don't have much of a winter to keep things warm in. However, you know, the air conditioning. And so we're looking at all of those aspects uh, with the extra dollars we've got coming in for housing infrastructure. We're going to make sure that we focus not only on our more affluent areas or even our areas that is utilized by most of us, but definitely not leave out our uh, low income communities. Because when we float one boat, if we're doing the right thing, all boats will float. And we want to ensure that our residents uh, we, you know, we've got a challenge with affordable housing in South Florida and especially in Palm Beach County. And so if we can reduce the cost of housing, that will help us uh, go a long way. So we, you know, we're also trying to work with our municipalities, building affordable workforce housing in areas where people can easily access work uh, is also a major, it's a major challenge, but we're going to accomplish it. We've got plans. We're working with our business community along with our municipalities. And I think we're in a, we're in a position where we're poised that everybody is now very, very conscious of it. It is it, all of us, not only from a personal level, but from a business level, because when people start to leave your community, to go to bedroom communities because it's more economical, that has a significant negative impact on your community. Uh, the dollars that your taxpayers are investing in businesses uh, is now being circulated in another county. So we need those dollars to come back and be circulated within our own community. So we must build resiliency, not only in our businesses, but also in our homes. 
Fantastic. And thank you for that. Would anyone like to expand on that? Jimmy. Yeah. Hey, Commissioner, um, for, you know, I, earlier I mentioned that we have started, for example, with our septic to sewer program in the Little River uh, Basin area. Not only uh, did we do that because Little River empties into the bay and obviously has an impact there, but also you have uh, lower income areas there, uh, underrepresented communities historically, and, uh, and, and not being on sanitary, having a sanitary sewer system uh, really stifles the economic development. You're not going to see businesses and jobs grow in an area that has, is on septic. Um, so by, not only are we investing in a cleaner bay with respect to trying to clean up Little River itself, canal, but we're also trying to create the economic opportunity and jobs um, by investing in the infrastructure that is both green, but at the same time, will let businesses grow, jobs be created, and perhaps create economic opportunity. So you can use that investment, uh, not only to improve the environment, but to really uh, improve the economy, uh, and as a result, create some economic equity. Fantastic. Mr. Costezzi, counties have limited resources and staff. What are counties doing to deal with the extra load imposed by the consequences of climate change? Who is applying for and managing grants? Who is handling all the new work? Well, in Monroe County, we're very fortunate. Uh, I guess 10, 12 years ago, we were able to recruit Rhonda Haig, um, and uh, she's our chief resiliency officer. She's on the call, uh, as you all see there. And Rhonda is one of those employees that does the work of two or three, four people uh, at one person. And then she's also been around a long time. I think uh, we worked together about 25 years ago at the Water Management District. So she has a, a really a hefty Rolodex uh, contact list and she knows who to, who to contact and who to hire uh, to help us. Uh, so we outsource a lot of, the, a lot of uh, the, the grant writing and the grant management. Uh, she knows who to go to. Uh, she's been very successful at it, obviously. We'll talk about some of our grants that we just received this week uh, later. And uh, you know, we, we also have our legislative affairs director, Lisa Tennyson, they work closely together because you know, once you, you, you apply for the grants, then somebody has to bird dog these things up in Tallahassee and in Washington. And we have a pretty robust team of lobbyists and consultants uh, that they both manage and they cut them loose to, to try to get some of this money that we've been getting and we've been very successful at it because of them too. So uh, you know, in our case, we again, very lucky. We have very, very good staff uh, that is very knowledgeable, has a, has a great understanding of South Florida and who's who in Tallahassee and in Washington. And outsourcing it has, has, been, has been our, our, our game plan since, since day one uh, because it ebbs and flows. So some of these efforts ebbs and flow. You know, just a, a few months ago, they opened up the, um, the grant program in Tallahassee and it was like, okay, it's open, it's open for two months. So you're 45 days, it was some crazy time period and we had a bunch of grants to be written. So uh, Rhonda and Lisa got out there and got the consultants. They wrote the grants, they, they followed the grants and uh, now that works over. And then as we get the grants, then we turn to management and then a different set of outsourcing is, is required to, uh, to manage the grants. And again, they know who, who, who to go to. We go to you, to the commissioners and we get the uh, support. We've always had the support from the commissioners when we get these programs going. Uh, so again, it's it's in our DNA. You know, I might say that a few more times before this thing's over. Uh, we know what we need to do in the keys, and everything from grant applications to grant management. Uh, so, uh, our, our guess in the nutshell, we outsource the work as needed. I, I will also I go will ahead, also, please. I will also say, you know, because oftentimes you don't hear it, but I'm going to give kudos to the federal government because I have to tell you. Um, you know, th this region truly was impacted by the pandemic, and and when you have an economy that is tourist based and people aren't moving, um, they're terrible impact. So and it's and 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 we were all impacted uh, from the bottom to the top, and so it was very helpful for the government, the federal government, to understand particularly. Um, when they were um, understanding of the fact that maybe in some cases you need to bypass the state and put that money directly in these counties to begin to, to get that work done. There was a lot that we needed to do to shore up the pandemic, number one, but the economy, number two. And um, 
you know, it was very helpful to be able to, to depend on those dollars and, and move quickly to get that. Um, I agree with um, with Roman. We uh, we were able to put some small businesses to work. Um, so whatever programs that we uh, we were initiating to pull ourselves out of this, we tried to keep in the forefront that um, our local businesses need to be a part of that. There were a lot of agencies um, from around the country knocking on the door. And some of them were really up and running and probably did have an upper leg on, on, on some of our locals, but we tried to make sure that they didn't get um, left behind. So um, um, I think that understanding that you need to get the money in, in a crisis, you need to get it um, to the locals so that they can move it quickly was very helpful because normally, you know, your money goes to the state, the state figure out how and when it wants to share. And, you know, time is um, uh, passing by. So kudos to the federal government in, in that instance that we were able to get the money directly and, and quickly move to, to solve our problems as they were occurring. Yeah, Commissioner, if I might, on, on behalf of sure. our, the team that the, uh, the mayor has put together, um, you know, uh, uh, in addition to uh, her having uh, giving me the uh, a large uh, infrastructure and uh, 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 in departments uh, like water sewer and public works and whatnot to, to coordinate. You know the team she's put together: Jim Murley, our chief resiliency officer, and his team working hard on the grants and managing that process. Arella Begay, uh, our chief bay officer, many years working closely with state and federal agencies, and really has brought that uh, tremendously on behalf of fighting for the bay. Uh, uh, Jane Gilbert, our chief heat officer. And her work, you know, we work closely with the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce and the business community. Really brought them in because they clearly see resiliency and um, and dealing with climate change as part of their strategy. And they help us obviously with the federal and state agencies. And I have to do a shout out to our Office of Management and Budget, Dave Clotfeld and his team, uh, putting together our budgets and helping us with our proposals. Uh, again, it you know, if it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a large group of folks uh, to try to uh, work with uh, to create a a successful and funded resiliency plan. I'd like to also add, uh, not, I, I can't let the other uh, administrators talk about their staff and I don't talk about the outstanding team PBC we have here in Palm Beach County. We've talked about the de silos. So when we talk about infrastructure or we talk about housing and homelessness, we've got all those agencies across the board working together. But most of all, not only the federal government, but our own local government, my commissioners have been extremely supportive of projects and outlines that we brought to them with their input. They've given us the direction to move forward on specific items and how uh, at the end of the day, they want it done. However, they've allowed us the flexibility to move dollars around, to make sure that we're meeting the strategic goals that they have outlined within the federal rules. We have worked with our, our friends at NACO who has gone to treasury and got the specific answers that we needed and how to plan and implement expending these dollars so that in future years, they don't come back and claw those dollars back out of Avalora. So I think NACO gets a huge shout out FAC gets and their staff gets a huge shout out from us locally because we have been working through them as well as the League of Cities at their national level. They have been working with us to ensure uh, we are working with our federal agency treasury. Uh, you know, when they started with CARES was the first time that they actually implemented such a program. And so a lot of the rules came at a later date when we were trying to get those dollars out the door as fast as we possibly could to our businesses in our community as well as our residents. Uh, I think that they learned a lot the first process. And so now with the ARPA dollars, uh, you can see through their uh, temporary, I shouldn't say temporary, they're almost final draft of the rules, uh, we're getting better and better. Again, I'm hoping with the infrastructure dollars coming down the pike that we're able to work very closely with the Army Corps of Engineers so that we can speed up the process for their approval to get these dollars expended within the timeframes that the feds have 
laid out. But I know that we'll continue to work with uh, NACO, the Treasury, et cetera. And as we start to get closer to those deadlines uh, working together, we may be able to meet the existing deadlines or get them to extend it so that we can properly implement uh, the infrastructure programs. Excellent. Don't you worry. I wasn't going to leave Palm Beach County out. I was just about to call on you because uh, <laughs> as a former staffer myself, it's always good to, uh, to get those accolades. Ms. Henry, the four counties of the compact have dedicated staff for resilience work, but many municipalities do not, which we just heard about the League of Cities. How can they start dealing with climate change without dedicated staff? Well, um, if um, if they if we all uh, subscribe to the thought that it's it should become a part of everyone's DNA and that you put systems in place to make sure that you're looking at um, the issues of resilience and and you're collaborating within your county with your with your municipal partners, no one wants to get left behind. Um, you, you, the more you talk about it, the more you tout the benefits, um, we're, we're putting a, a resiliency website in place so that every city um, and, and, and maybe down to communities within cities that have initiatives that they want to share, that, that we're sharing it because that, that, that sparks the ideas, it sparks the enthusiasm. Um, for, hey, I can't, my community can't get left behind. Um, it's interesting in Broward, um, we have, unlike um, um, my uh, counties to the north and south, we have a very, very small uh, unincorporated area. So um, our municipalities make up um, the, you know, the, our, our, our county. And, and so they recognize early on, and I'm going to kudos to the elected officials, because I will tell you that that we have have and have had elected officials who um, are, were, you know, rabid about the issue. I mean, they were, you know, they were pounding the administration to make sure that, you know, it gets pounded into you. you when you come talk to me, um, you need to tell me about this. And I and I can I can remember sitting on the dais and having commissioners look at me and said, are we um, what are we putting on the roof of that building? Why don't we have a plan to make sure that we have photovoltaics on that building? Why have it? So after a while, um, you you don't want to be left out. And I and I think with within municipalities and also having that dialogue with uh, their colleagues. And now, um, and having a real effort to promote what everyone's doing, you don't want to be left out. You will start to make sure that you have something to brag around. You, you know, we can all, we all like to have, have that. And so um, as um, more and more people are incentivized with that um, in any way that you can, I, um, I, I think it's, it's a good thing. The title is irrelevant. You know, you can have the title, but, you know, many people were doing these sorts of things without that title for many, many, for many, many years. So it's really the work that's, you know, that goes behind uh, the title. You can call yourself pretty much what you want, but as long as your, your administrative infrastructure is, is there's a checkbox. Did you, did you look at, did you do this? Um, who did you collaborate with? And um, are, are you sharing? Um, I just had a conversation with one of my uh, commissioners at the last Tuesday's commission meeting. He said, okay, so it looks like we're putting fiber down um, along this corridor. So uh, county administrator, um, who did you notify uh, to let, quite frankly, municipalities or other major institutions in the area know so that they can take advantage of that. So, you know, it, it comes from the top, it comes from the bottom up. And, and I don't think that um, now, fortunately in the South Florida region, everybody's tuned in, no one wants to be left out. 
and kudos to the, the, the constant work that started with certain elected officials in this region that's now become part of our, I'm going to take this from you, uh, DNA in South Florida. I like it. We're going to have to name something after DNA. <laughs> Would anyone else like to comment? Yes, I'd like to comment on that. Uh, I think as leaders of the county, we have a responsibility uh, to encourage uh, the cities uh, to, to move in this direction. And in Monroe County is a perfect example. Luckily, we only have five cities, uh, but Rhonda <laughs> has been uh, after those five cities to do a LIDAR elevation study uh, for a couple of years now. We did it over two years ago, it's expensive um, and they haven't done it. And finally she you know, went and got in front of each, each uh, council and commission and now they're doing it. And now they see the importance of it as this grant program came out uh, six months ago, they weren't ready because they didn't have the elevation data. So all of a sudden they're, they're, they're now they wanna do it because they know that there's money starting to flow from the state and then the feds next. Um, but Rhonda has been you know, just encouraging them for years and finally was, talk, was able to talk them into it and help them. She got uh, you know, preferential treatment uh, from the vendors and got good pricing because they're gonna do all five at the same time. So as county leaders, I think we, we, we should be helping out the municipalities, let's face it, we have a little bit more resources most of the time than they do. So I think that's important. Robin, I, I agree with you, and I, I believe in Palm Beach County, we've definitely collaborated with our cities. We've, done, we've been doing the LIDAR uh, for a period of time because that also helps with uh, our ratings as far as how resilient we are, where our issues are, the infrastructure problems. And so we've got the LIDAR, and we do share it with our cities. But in addition to that, uh, we here in Palm Beach County, we're lucky because we ha we've got 39 municipalities here in Palm Beach County. Uh, in addition to that, we work closely with them. We've got some municipalities uh, that have dedicated staff to uh, resiliency and sustainability. And so that has helped us a, a lot. They tend to be our large municipalities. However, having said that, uh, we currently have been successful in collaborating with seven of our municipalities in all sizes along our coastal resiliency uh, partnership of uh, Southeast Palm Beach County. And those partnerships include City of Boca Raton, uh, which is 100,000, around 100,000 people, as well as Ocean Ridge with a population of Rickley, uh, around 2,000. And all of the communities involved have pitched in and provided what resources they could on a joint vulnerability assessment. That has significantly helped us. Uh, we ended up with a grant. We're working together. And these are our coastal communities that uh, with King Tide, you know, roads are flooding out. And so we all need to plan because it, when it impacts one of our cities, it impacts the entire county uh, for that, uh, you know, for that reason. And uh, also our smaller communities uh, along the coast is a bit more costly to live, but we do have pockets of lower income areas. And so with the planning of this and identifying uh, our vulnerability and, and establishing uh, mitigating situations for it, it will benefit all of us and put us in a position so that we can <coughs> actually draw down funding. I think the other yep. thing Broward County did that I, and, and, and um, I felt, I, I feel like it's been helpful um, is that we, put out challenge grants. So our board, um, as part of its general fund budget, set up a fund um, that we could that we would make available to uh, municipalities um, when they have resiliency projects um, that they could um, actually apply for. So it helps our smaller municipalities um, um, from an economic standpoint. So Counties, um, you know, we uh, we're very fortunate that that um, my entire board loves the leadership on this. I mean, they're all they're all together. There's no there um, there's no question that this is something that is a priority for the county, and they're willing to put their money where their mouth um, is at this point, and um, and 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 make major investments um, for the community that our municipalities can tap into. 
That's fantastic. Wonderful. And um, I'm sorry, panelists. I uh, we have a very robust Q and A building, and so this is going to be our final topic that we're going to discuss, and it's one that I want to hear about because it's self serving. And uh, Mr. Morales, we're going to start with you. County administrations have collective experience. What advice do you have for mayors and elected officials, especially as term limits and elections keep elected officials changing quite regularly? How does staff keep elected officials engaged? Jimmy, let's start with you. Yeah, no, we, we need to work very closely with the elected officials. You know, resiliency um, is a challenging, uh, um, it's expensive. Uh, it can be disruptive, you know, ripping up roads, elevating roads, putting in large infrastructure. You know, most taxpayers and voters don't want to spend more money uh, and have uh, disruption in their life. And so, um, uh, and, and so from, from a political perspective, it's easy to sort of not do anything, let, you know, kick that can down the road. Um, so as we know, all that means is things get worse and more expensive. Um, and often it takes an emergency like we, you know, all of a sudden the bay became important when a couple of years ago there was a huge fish kill. And all of a sudden people said, oh, my God, what's going on? Even though advocates have been talking about it for years. So it's important that we uh, we educate our uh, our elected officials, that we engage with them, that we present to them the facts and what the consequences are of not doing something, that we also help them uh, by going out of the community and educating the community, engaging the community to create the political support for the elected officials to then do something. Um, and it's not easy to vote for a, whether it's a tax increase or issuing bonds uh, or, you know, like I said, uh, vote to uh, have a project in a neighborhood that is really disrupting their lives. So um, I think uh, a more educated electorate uh, about these issues, and these are complicated issues, um, uh, will, I think, helps the elected officials. And the more they know about it and understand it, the more also they can effectively uh, communicate so that, um, you know, they can, they can, we can keep the momentum on these projects. Because even when you do have an emergency, you know, whether it's a fish kill in Biscayne Bay or huge flooding on Miami Beach on a sunny day, you know, at a certain point when you, you, you sort of stop the, you know, fix the emergency issues that are short term, you can also lose momentum because people then say, OK, we fixed the problem. Uh, and that's not the case. This is not a problem you fix. This is one you have to adapt to and, and, and learn to live with over time and mitigate. Sure. And you, you can't you sort of can't take your foot off the pedal. Uh, for too long with this. So I think we got to create um, the support base for them, the elected officials, and make sure they are, are educated so they can educate uh, their electorate as well. Fantastic. And we'll just go down the line. Roman, anything to add? Uh, just a little historical. When we started uh, this discussion and this, and this uh, compact 13 years ago, we had commissioners uh, on, on our commission in Monroe County that didn't want to talk about it. They were, quote, deniers. And not only were they deniers, they didn't want to talk about it because they thought it was going to affect our economy, it was going to affect our real estate, and you know it's not happening, it's not happening, you know. And then the tide has totally changed. Now I think I don't think any any elected official will get elected in the Keys if they don't talk about what we're doing and moving forward. So it's it's it's, it's done a complete 180, um, and it's 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 at the top of the list of what needs to be talked about and done in the next few years, no doubt. So. Um, it's for us, it's easy. I mean, we're, you know, again, canary in a coal mine. So nobody's going to get elected in the Keys without talking about sea level rise and adaptation. <laughs> so noted. Miss Henry. I, I, I'm i going to make this easy. Ditto Jimmy, ditto Roman. Um, again, being a part um, of this collaborative for as many years as we've been and, and people seeking to be elected to um, the, you know, the county commission, they're going to be asked about this. They will be, um, they will be queried about this. And so the more they're educated, the more knowledgeable they are, the more we, we get converts. So ditto um, to those comments for both of them. Fantastic. Miss Baker to, uh, to round us out. I'm going to say ditto to all three that <laughs> spoke earlier. I, I know the most important key is continuing to educate the community on this, and they will be asking those questions. They will be demanding. Uh, I believe that my existing board, I'm quite sure with the other three counties, you are all very conscious of it because it's, it's hitting our business community. It's affecting our home ownership. Uh, we're going to get to the place where we, you know, we're going to have to uh, 
look at insurance policies and whether our people can, can afford the insurance on this. We've got to build resiliency. And I think in our all in our five-year and 10-year capital plans, they're there. It is going to be incumbent upon staff as new board members come on to make sure that they're uh, educated, that they understand why we've got certain uh, elements within the capital plan so that we don't constantly change that plan year after year. But if we stay consistent, we'll make great strides in making sure we've got the proper infrastructure in place to lead us into the future. Thank you. And thank you all. This has been a really incredible and wonderful discussion. Now we're going to take some questions, Q&A from the audience. And we only have nine minutes left. And we have some I'm looking over here in the chat, some really fantastic questions. So to the audience, I apologize if we don't get to all of them. And just panelists, remember to try to keep your, your answers succinct so that we can plow through some of these. Uh, first up, we have, have local government decisions on new land use changes and development applications changed enough from past practices to meet the enormity of the challenge posed by global warming and sea level rise? If not, what, what needs to change about where and how we build? Mr. Richard Grosso, who wants to take that one? I'll start in the keys. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we're doing some a lot of... Uh, uh, acquisitions, land acquisitions, and I, I think it's going to help. Uh, sometimes we're going to have to use some of these properties for these pumps that I talked about and some of the infrastructure for the stormwater. So I think uh, we've had to do it for other reasons. As you know, in the Keys, we have a, you know, a hurricane evacuation model that limits our, our growth. Uh, but now we've morphed into getting some of these properties to, to use as infrastructure uh, for some of these stormwater projects that we have to do in the, in the near future. Okay, awesome, thank you. This one is uh, near and dear to my heart, so we're gonna go with it. Do you all feel supported by Tallahassee in your resiliency planning efforts? Can I take that one again? Because uh, yeah, we got $5 million this year. I mean, just this week, uh, finally, the, the Tallahassee is, is on board. They have a program now. Uh, they had a, a chief resiliency officer. Um, and I think they, uh, they're into discussion. Sure. And, and again, I, I know that Jimmy got like 60, $70 million. Uh, we got five, which for us is a lot of money it helps with the two projects. So yes, I think Tallahassee's on board. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll echo that. I think, um, you know, both in terms of funding issues, working with the agencies, the different agencies, um, I think, um, they have gotten religion on this issue in a major way. And they've recognized that environment is economy, environment is quality of life. And, um, and so I, I do think we're, uh, uh, we're getting a lot more support uh, than, than in the past. And I look forward to uh, continued support from Tallahassee into the future because Ms. Morales is absolutely correct. If we don't protect our natural areas, uh, you know, our businesses, it's going to have a significant negative impact. And we've got a lot of businesses moving to South Florida. So we've got to ensure that we are protecting the environment. And I do believe Tallahassee is starting to see the light on that particular issue. And if I may, Commissioner, I'll never lose, miss an opportunity to suck up. And uh, you were a big part of that. Your last eight years that you were there, you started that conversation eight years ago. So <laughs> thank you for your leadership, so. Uh, so noted. Uh -huh. The water related climate risks are coming from both sides, not just along the coast. What are the counties doing to fill the data gaps on the west side, especially for communities forgotten, like the tribal reservations, Jill Horowitz, maybe uh, Broward or Palm Beach to answer that. We are addressing uh, those issues. We're looking at them. We're working with our agricultural industry uh, and it's primarily our glades areas, uh, which is our lower income type neighborhoods. So we are focused, our district commissioner, Commissioner McKinley never ceases to say, hey, we need to be focusing on this particular areas and the rest of the commission does support it. Uh, she not only talks about it on the local level, but at the state and the federal level to ensure that we are make, we're not pumping bad water out of those areas. Our canals are properly maintained. Uh, Lake Okeechobee is a serious issue for us here in Palm Beach County because the water coming out of the North 
into our lake needs to be cleaned up before it ever reaches Lake Okeechobee because then the water flows to the south. And so that impacts our, our Everglades area. So we are working in tandem with the state, with the feds, uh, and we're starting to see movement. Our agricultural industry is working with us. So we've got a partnership that we're starting to definitely move forward and make sure the water in our Western area drainage you know, uh, the cleanliness of the water coming out of there uh, is, is being taken care of. I, I would also add that it's really important that, that counties invest in, the, in developing the data to make the case. Um, uh, we have been working with the South Florida Water Management District about um, the, the condition of the pumps. We know um, that um, where we are today will not be sustainable in the future. So we're having to invest millions to start to, to perform these studies so that we can walk into whether it's the water management district or the state or the federal government and put, and put in front of them, here's Here's why this is critical. Here's what is happening. You know, we can get past the, you can't you see it to now we can actually show them data. And, and as I said, just we're spending millions to do those studies so that we can go with a targeted request to invest and be able to show what the, what the results and the consequences of either working with us or not working with us. So um, getting that data in front of the, the, uh, the state and, and, and its respective agencies or the federal government um, is key. As you all know, working with the Army Corps um, um, has its challenges at time. And so rather than just wait and hope, we're, we're sort of partnering with ourselves to collect that data, to put it in front of them, to give them the impetus to start to, to move. Boy, that's an understatement. <laughs> uh, no, I just wanted to add that a lot of people think sea level rise and climate change is a coastal uh, phenomenon. But in fact, some of our most vulnerable areas are actually in Western and Southern Dade, uh, where we'll see flooding. Uh, and for, for a number of years now, we've had challenges and some of our elected officials on our commission were leaders in fighting flooding in Sweetwater and Doral and other areas. We have a very aggressive uh, program to acquire environmentally sensitive properties, endangered lands. Uh, and in fact, some of that money we received this week from the state was to enable us to buy uh, farmlands and other properties uh, so that we can keep the flow of water, clean water and, and reduce any contaminants from development. Um, and, uh, and even some of our land use policies of late, we're trying to protect that urban development boundary line and make sure that we're not having a, a, an adverse a environmental impact on our property. So, um, so we are sensitive to the, uh, the, knowing that the Western areas along the Everglades and the Everglades itself are challenged by climate change. Yeah, amen to that. And uh, our last question, I'm gonna take a point of personal privilege since I'm moderating and uh, it's come up. So Mr. Morales, get ready. Florida Keys were able to overcome the septic tank problem. So why can't Miami follow the same protocol is there a timeline in place to begin work? There's also a similar question that would like you to speak to the cost effectiveness. And that was from Adrian Barman. Well, you know, I, I actually was city attorney of Marathon at the time that the uh, Florida Keys, uh, you know, and it came, you know, the Keys, as you know, were, were an are an area of critical state concern. It was a mandate that came down from the state. And, um, and uh, part of the program I know Marathon was that the, you know, this, uh, there was funding that was obtained, uh, I think some uh, federal and state funding to help with it, but also bonds issued. And they brought a line in front of your home. I have a small house down there and you had to connect to it. And even if you didn't, you started get, they started charging you. So it, it really came down as a mandate. There was some effort to try to help some folks who couldn't afford to connect, but, um, uh, but ultimately it happened. And I can attest to the improvement of water quality. Um, you know, in, in Dade County, we've got uh, obviously 120,000 such properties. Um, we've got some folks who, uh, I think part of it is the economic challenge of, connecting. Um, uh, you know, we, there are even homes today that candidly are on a line and haven't connected, uh, but go back, go before uh, Environmental Quality Control Board and get deferrals of it. I think, A, some of it's going to have to be a political will to realize that, you know, we have to connect and we can try to help people afford those costs and, and we're going to try to work with it. But part of it is 
we have to realize it's such a priority that we have to do it. We obviously, as the government, have the responsibility of paying for building out the sanitary sewer system to connect to. But there's going to be a combination of some tough love. You know, I'm prepared to connect if I have to, but I can afford it. Um, but also trying to help those who can't afford or small businesses. Uh, and there, maybe you could use CDBG funds or things like that to then help them. But it's going to take the political will. And I think we're getting there in a big Good. way at the county to do that. Absolutely. And thank you for that. Well, everyone, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your very busy schedules on this beautiful Friday to share your experience and your insights with us. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Megan. Thank you all so much. It's great to hear how much support we have and leadership we have in the resiliency space from our county administration. So thank you all. And thank you, Commissioner, for moderating a great panel. We now will turn it over to another panel on resilient water management that you're not going to want to miss. So please click on that next session and we'll see you all there. Thank you all so much.